one of the requirements for being an American is to have this kind of amnesia, to be forgetful about, you know, what has happened even recently. Welcome to Overlap, brought to you by Breakthrough News and Wave Media. My name is Nazia Kazi, and I'm Associate Professor of Anthropology and author of Islamophobia, Race, and Global Politics. Overlap is a global conversation with rotating hosts that is based on a simple concept. While U.S. elites are working to build a new Cold War environment with China, we want to do the opposite with people-to-people -people dialogue and virtual exchanges that show how much we have in common and how much we have to lose from a new policy of isolation and demonization. I'm excited to be joined by Albert Wang, a key opinion leader across Chinese social media. Welcome to the show, Albert. Hello, Nazia. Thank you for having me, and it's great to be back. Maybe I can tell you a little bit about what actually took place there and um, what's happening here in the U.S. And then we can hear from you about how folks in China have understood this event. So basically what happened last month in early February was a train operated by a company called Norfolk Southern. It derailed and on board this train were poisonous chemicals. And what happened after the train derailment was what was called a control burn. So authorities decided to basically deal with this derailment by setting the, 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 the uh, materials on fire. So now we saw these poisonous chemicals being released into the air and water. And many experts have said this might turn out to be the biggest environmental disaster in American history. Well, actually, that was the first disaster. <laughs> the second disaster was the response from the U.S. government, or maybe more appropriately, the lack of the response. But before we get into all that, I think it's important to take a look at kind of the recent history. Um, so just a few months ago in the U.S., uh, rail workers were actually on the brink of going on strike. And the reason for that is because rail workers in America have dealt with increasingly difficult work environments, um, really uh, no kind of paid sick leave. And this is especially important during the years of the pandemic. And then very few safety protocols on American trains. So our trains are longer, they are less safe, and they have essentially been deregulated to a large extent. Um, they also use really, really old technology. I mean, technology from the 1800s. And then over the past several decades, we've seen massive layoffs in the rail industry. So there are fewer workers to operate these, you know, longer trains. Um, so that's really important backdrop to what we saw happen in East Palestine. Now, I recently saw reports that the soil in East Palestine, which is likely contaminated from this derailment, will be sent to a local incinerator to basically burn. Uh, and this is a company, the company that runs the incinerator, that has a long history of clean air violations. And so I think residents of East Palestine and the neighboring towns are worried that this is going to end up not only contaminating their water, but contaminating their air. I mean, this incinerator already burns waste from the U.S. Department of Defense, so the military, and has gotten in trouble in the past for contaminating the air. Um, it's important to note that the U.S. military is actually the biggest polluter on planet Earth. So that's really important. I think it's important to know that, you know, the federal government's response has been extremely weak. Um, this should have been a disaster, declared a disaster immediately. Um, the federal government hasn't really forced Norfolk Southern to take accountability. There is a small pool of money, something like $1,000 per family in place, but it's very hard to get and it's not eligible for all of the residents of the town. Um, so the emergency response has been really, really weak. Um, you know, and of course, this is from a government that recently sided with the owners of companies like Norfolk Southern uh, against rail workers in the issue I was just naming earlier. Recently, it was announced that some federal authorities are going to go door to door in the town and ask people about their symptoms. But it's important to know that this is only after there was sort of much public outcry. Um, it's in response to that public outcry. Um, 
we're hearing now that the CEO of Norfolk Southern, Alan Shaw, may appear before Congress to report on what happened. But the problem is, of course, this, that U.S. Congress is packed with pro-business um, individuals. And they have sided against rail workers, they have sided against safety regulations, and they have sided on behalf of the rail companies time and time again. Uh, the governor of Ohio, Mike DeWine, he's a Republican, and he, he himself and his Republican party have received hundreds of thousands of dollars in political donations from the company Norfolk Southern itself. So it should come as no surprise uh, when we see him really downplaying the severity of this crisis time and time again. So that's that's largely what we've seen here in the U.S. Um, but, you know, I'm curious, Albert, to hear what folks in China have heard about this accident and what are the main points that the public in China hears about with regards to this incident? Thank you for your information. And uh, what I want to uh, mention before my answer is that, first of all, it's this thing is happening in the United States. And for the Chinese people, uh, it's quite curious for us that because we learned this information firstly from Twitter, not from like CNN or Fox News, those nation level uh, networks. It's the, it's the first thing. So at the very beginning, a lot of the people don't even think it is something true. Are you guys making some joke or something else? So, uh, but later on, uh, people uh, found out that it is actually happening in the United States. So uh, after that, the Chinese society holds a very diverse position on this incident. Uh, I have to mention that as the conflict between China and America deepens, so many public opinion about America is actually reflecting the stand and the view of each interest group in China. So not many people care about the truth for uh, the incident. For example, uh, there was a news I read about an accidental death of a five-member investigation team on its way to Ohio. I later found out that the investigation team was actually heading to another place and had nothing to do with the Eastern Palestine incident. But for many Chinese netizens, they were happy to make a connection between these two things, these two events. Uh, so in this case, people who are concerned about the truth of the incident itself are actually not willing to express much opinion because they don't want to get labeled as pro-American. So that was the first discussion. The second discussion is focused on why the US media is not covering this story. So many people found out that only the local media reported this accident. The national level media, such as like CNN or Fox News, like I mentioned, uh, didn't pay much attention on this matter. Actually, I read one article about this on the health section on BBC, uh, the website. Yeah, they didn't pay much attention on this. At the same time, the so-called Chinese spy balloon incident was so like heavily reported. So there are a lot of the people who would choose to believe the US wanted to cover up the domestic disaster by reporting heavily on a conspiracy theory against China. Well, the third group concerned about the development of infrastructure in America. And this part, in my opinion, is the most valuable one. There is a very famous video that has gone viral in China showing a train moving so carefully on an old American railway. Many people are surprised that, as a world hegemon, I mean, Americans can strike anywhere on the globe within 24 hours, but has no way to maintain a good railway system. I mean, I understand most of you guys don't, don't, don't really like Donald Trump, but I remember clearly that his campaign team once said it would take only one trillion American dollar to renew all the transportation infrastructure in America. I mean, the White House spent 20 years and two trillion dollars in Afghanistan. And this country is like still the same as it was 20 years ago. Since the infrastructure in America has very poor uh, investment, some of them are becoming Afghanistan level. So just think about it. I mean, just think about it. If Americans can spend that much money on construction, then today, the White House and state governors, they can all happily 
happily brag about their accomplishment without having to think about how to fix the employment number on the, their uh, statistical report. So, I mean, for the Chinese people, like 40 years ago, like my, my parents, for their generation, American was like a teacher for us, like, like, like a model. You got beautiful roads, well-connected highway system and well-connected uh, railway system. We want it to be the same. We learn, we chase, we tried, we built, we accomplished, we broke so many records. Uh, 40 years later, we Chinese, we have, we also have beautiful roads. We have magnificent bridges. We have well-connected railway system, but things are falling apart in the United States. I mean, we don't want to be the same. So what happened to uh, America? That was a good lesson for us to learn. After all, I mean, I do have the question, who is going to be uh, responsible for such an accident? Because, you know, uh, we had a high-speed train collision in 2011. This incident finally led to the stepping down of the Minister of Railway and a reorganization of the ministry. So what's going to happen in America and who is going to be responsible? What are the cause of the tragedy? You know, if you were paying attention to the mainstream conversation in the American media, which you're right, it's very sparse, uh, very little attention is being paid to something of this magnitude. You would go away thinking, you know, it's either one political party, the Democrats or the Republicans who are responsible for this. So right now you see this blame game in the American media with both parties trying to blame the other. So the Democrats are saying, you know, it was Donald Trump's deregulation of the rail industry that was responsible for this. And then, of course, the Republicans are trying to point a finger at Pete Buttigieg from the Biden administration, who is the transportation secretary. But the fact of the matter is both parties are actually to blame. Um, so it was Donald Trump who uh, made some key deregulation of the um, rail industry. But it was also Joe Biden who sided with the railroad industry executives against rail workers. So to your question, like who's gonna be responsible for this and who, who's gonna pay for this? I take my cues from American history, which is that the people always have to pay for corporate wrongdoings. The people in the US are always left holding the bill for corporate crimes. So in the way of history, let's take what happened in you know 2008, where there was a, a mortgage scandal and it was found that the finance industry had basically broken the law, given illegal mortgages to countless American workers. Both Bush and Obama sided with Wall Street. And what we saw was a massive wave of, um, you know, evictions where people saw ordinary Americans saw generations of wealth wiped out. Countless Americans lost their homes um, and nobody from the finance or banking industry was really held legally accountable for this. Or let's look at environmental disasters themselves. So in Flint, Michigan, in 2014, the drinking water uh, was basically poisoned with lead. Um, and Flint is a predominantly black city. And of course, uh, the water remained poisoned and unsafe to drink for quite some time. You know, it was Barack Obama who went and visited Flint, Michigan to declare the water safe to drink. And then he did what I thought was a very shameful show of kind of taking a very tiny sip of the drinking water, which was not yet safe, uh, to show that it was. Um, people yeah. were told that it was safe, and we see that happening in East Palestine right now. People are being told quickly that the water is safe, the air is safe, there's nothing to worry about, go back home, go back to work, etc. There's this massive cover-up. Uh, we could see the same thing with the oil disaster in 2010, which was a British Petroleum BP oil rig that exploded offshore drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. And immediately, so the Gulf of Mexico is a place where a lot of fishing and shrimping happens. People saw basically um, massive, um, you know, a killing of all of the wildlife, the marine wildlife in the area. And the fishing industry was hit really hard. BP basically turned to many of those fishermen and said, well, why don't you use your boats since you can't go out and work to help us uh, disperse this chemical in the water to clean up the oil spill. And of course, a lot of those fishermen wanted to wear masks because these chemical dispersants are quite hazardous to one's health. Um, and BP, once again, um, you know, engaged in a huge cover up about both the, the, the spill itself, 
and the chemical dispersant that was being used to clean up the disaster. Um, very recently in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, again, a, a, a predominantly black city, this was in 2022, the whole city was without drinkable water for quite some time. Um, or we could go to 2016 and look at Standing Rock, which is where a lot of protesters, Native American protesters, were protesting against an oil and gas pipeline. Um, these protesters were labeled terrorists by the U.S. for organizing to keep their water clean and safe. So we have to think of that history, which is that historically it has been, um, you know, the state and American corporate interests against the interests of ordinary American people. Um, so Norfolk Southern, the company responsible for this train derailment and other big businesses have really worked hard. They've worked overtime to block rail safety laws from being passed. And they have pus pushed for increased privatization of the rail industry. Um, there have been countless train derailments in the U.S. If you look at the statistics in the U.S. versus other countries, it is a really shocking rate of ra train derailments. There has even been one in Ohio by Norfolk Southern since this train derailment happened. And they always go unpunished. Um, and so co the companies know they can get away with it. Um, so this year alone, there have been over a dozen train derailments in the US. Um, in 2002, a train crashed in North Dakota um, that also had a uh, dangerous chemical on board. And thousands of people were trapped in their homes, uh, were not allowed to turn on their heat because there was a risk of you know explosions or fires catching. Um, and I think, you know, most Americans have not heard of this incident. It is buried deep uh, in there, you know. And so I think if we're going to ask who, you know, is going to be held responsible, history tells us that it's always the American people that are responsible, that pay the price for corporate wrongdoing. Um, yeah, I mean, that is that is quite sad, it, it, especially when you mentioned the 2008, the financial crisis. I remember one of my uh, classmates. Uh, back in uh, high school, his family lost their home during that crisis, and his parents got divorced for 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 that reason. And that was uh, yeah, that was sad. Absolutely. I mean, we really absolutely feel the results to to this day of the housing crisis. And uh, you know what it showed us was both our political parties will side with the major financial interests against ordinary people. Um, so I think we have a public that is very disillusioned uh, by the role of the state. Um, now, I want to yeah. turn to you and hear a little bit about the Chinese context where, you know, in China, it seems essential industries like railways. I mean, I want to know how are they run? Are they privately owned? Are they state run? Are they nationalized? How does the public in China see the nationalization of industries and corporations? Are they supportive of it? Uh, why or why not? Okay, uh, actually railroads are fully nationalized in China and uh, fully under control of the, uh, the, the government. So China's railway system are state owned and we had a ministry of railway, uh, so which was later reorganized uh, into a uh, state owned enterprise. It is responsible for operating, maintaining, upgrading and planning the railroads However, it was not state-owned before the establishment of the People's Republic of China. So before 1949, uh, Chinese people began, actually we began to build a uh, railway since the 19th century, when China was still under the rule of the Qing Dynasty, which was a uh, like ancient time for us. So however, many Western powers, uh, such as uh, the UK, France, Japan, whatever, uh, saw that was a good way to invade China. So they took control of Chinese railroads through like war, unequal treaties, or debt traps. Therefore, the railway system is seen as a very important symbol of independent uh, sovereignty in China. So after 1949, the state took full control of the railway system. Actually, not just the railway system for those things that are uh, matter to national interests, national security, and people's basic needs. They are all controlled by the state, like roads, electricity, water, telecommunication, things like that. For many Americans, when they hear about nationalization, like they think about Soviet Union or they think about a big red monster. But like, please don't be so dramatic. <laughs> In China, state-owned enterprises have gone through like so many reforms 
and are very market oriented in their management. So you can even buy their shares, actually. The meaning of state owned here is that the government has to be the biggest shareholder, has to have the power to make a final decision. Well, economically, China is a developing country. And just because we are growing fast and are the second largest economy today doesn't mean we have resources to waste. Well, when the United States developed the railways in 19th century, there were often several companies developing the same section of the line, which is a waste of like money or resources or manpower. China's railroads are well planned and will not let this thing happen. Like we don't need to build like 10 railroads between Beijing and Shanghai. We just need one. So in 2019, the year before the pandemic, during the Chinese Spring Festival, there were 3 billion trips made in China and they were properly arranged. So for private sector, I mean, you don't need to compete to own the road, but you compete on service. For example, the state will make investments on road, but you can compete on how to build the road. So the state will have the final say on how to use the road, but you can still make money and develop construction technology privately. The state owns all the airports, but private sector can compete on offering airlines. So I want to make an example here. Like when you go to Macy's, JCPenney's or Bloomingdale, whatever, they have elevators and escalators for you. They won't charge you to use them. That's the point of transportation. They connect business and consumers. Stores don't have to make uh, money from elevators. They want you to use them to shop. It is the same idea for trains and highways. Save some money from bombing others so you will have huge amount of money to maintain a good infrastructure. I mean, for people or cargo taking trains, all they want is a safe and fast trip. Uh, the state will be responsible for them. It is so efficient. I mean, think about it. Most of the airports are built far away from the urban area. It takes you a long time to get there. Uh, checking in, go through securities. It takes you hours to prepare the flight. But when you get to your destination, it takes you a long time to get to where you need to go. But train stations are often built inside urban areas. If a trip takes less than five hours, I will absolutely choose to take trains. So actually, I barely fly anymore. So like, that's my answer. Uh, I don't want to represent other Chinese, but for me, some level of nationalization is great for the general benefits. Uh, what about the public opinion on this in the US? Do people in the US support the privatization of these industries and why? You know, you spoke of the big red monster, and I think you couldn't have said it better. Uh, in the U.S., we are kind of force fed the language of privatization. In other words, we are taught that the privatization of, of industry is taken for granted in the U.S. Uh, people are taught to believe that running things for a profit motive rather than for what serves the public the best, that that is better, that that will do better. You know, we are taught this from a young age. Privatization is sort of the lifeblood of this country. Um, you know, we're not taught in the U.S. about the vast successes of countries. I mean, what you're describing about how, you know, the, the nationalization or the partial nationalization of major industries um, have been vastly successful. We're, we're not taught that. We're not taught about the countries around the world who devote a massive part of their um, government expenditure to social welfare spending, to public transportation, to public housing. Um, instead, in the U.S., uh, largely we see more and more sectors being privatized. That includes hospitals, that includes our gigantic prison system, that includes American universities. I mean, American universities are largely real estate institutions, even public universities, even universities that used to be free. Now these universities are institutions in which students will go into a lifetime of debt to get a, a degree, a university degree, um, astronomical debt. Um, it's approaching um, a couple trillion dollars, right, in the U.S. to get higher education. And just a few decades ago, a higher education degree was supposed to be, you know, free and available to the public at institutions like the University of California, 
or institutions like the city of New York. And now they are charging American students, uh, you know, vast amounts of, of, of money that they can't afford. So they end up going into debt. Um, students who have waged protests against universities doing this have been met with, um, you know, police in riot gear ready to crack down on these protesters who are who have simply engaged in gathering to protest tuition hikes at their universities. Um, the same can be said of hospitals. Hospitals are profit generators for the management class. Um, in the U.S., we see astronomical amounts of medical debt among the general population. People die with huge medical bills that they would never be able to pay. Increasingly, the internet is privatized in the U.S. So when you go online and search for something, you're going to see corporate interests represented. Um, and one of these things I'll, I'll tell you, which might be interesting and depressing for your um, audience, is student lunch debt. By this, I mean public school students. I mean, young children, elementary school, kindergarten through 12th graders, if they do not pay for their school provided lunch, they get punished. So if they haven't paid their student loan debt, I mean, student lunch debt, they're not allowed to go play during recess. They're not allowed to go on the school field trip. They're not allowed to participate in school activities. So students, young children, six, eight-year-olds are being punished for the crime of not being able to afford the lunch um, provided at their school. So this is really interesting. Can they, can, I mean, uh, sorry to interrupt. Can they, can they bring their own lunch? A lunch? Uh, I mean, they can, but look, the people who are availing themselves of the student lunch program are, you know, um, often poor Americans for whom, I mean, look, we can't underestimate the food crisis in the U.S. There are what we call food deserts. And what a food desert is, is like a town that doesn't have a grocery store that sells produce. So there are whole cities and towns in the U.S. where, and of course, these are predominantly, you know, with working poor folks who are the residents, where the only place you can get a meal is a, is a, you know, an unhealthy fast food restaurant or a corner store where you can go in and buy a bag of chips. Um, so there is a food crisis in this country and it stems from this crisis of privatization that you're talking about. So in, in the US, we are force fed, as I said, this, this discourse, right, about how if we let things be run publicly, it will make people lazy, people won't want to work, people will take advantage of them. And this is even in spite of what I've just described, that we see privately run entities falling apart all the time. Um, you know, I mean, we, we talked earlier about the financial industry. I remember a few years ago, Wells Fargo Bank, a major bank, basically committed major fraud, creating millions of fake bank accounts without people's consent. Um, HSBC USA, another major bank, was involved in laundering money for drug cartels at the very time that the, the U.S. government is saying it's tough on drugs and locking up working people for low level drug offenses. And, and, you know, in the U.S., when we do see the government spending money on things, it is 100 percent on defense, <laughs> on militarism. Right. I mean, you can't. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can. you can. You can always. You can always tell everyone. Everyone in this world can always tell that the United States is so powerful by looking at its military. You're right about that. I mean, this is the thing: is when uh, the American public asks for things like, uh, you know, nationalized healthcare, they say, "Well, how are we going to pay for it?" When we ask for our roads and houses to be fixed up, it's how are we going to pay for it? But magically, we can make mountains of money appear for, quote unquote, defense, for militarism. Um, the U.S. government has even spent millions of dollars to basically promote the military at American sporting events. They call it paid patriotism to use these sporting events that the American public tunes into, mostly American football, to use these as an opportunity to get people to recruit, to recruit people to join the military or to portray the military uh, favorably. And even our defense spending is increasingly privatized. So we have companies like Raytheon or Lockheed Martin that are major weapons manufacturers. And then we see key executives from these companies going on to hold appointments in the government. So our you know, defense secretary used to be on the board of one of these major companies. We also see these companies paying for math and science programs in schools that have a budgetary crisis. So schools in poor neighborhoods in the United States will get their science lab funded 
by the weapons industry. Um, and that's how the problem of our, our, our crisis of, of falling apart public schools is quote unquote solved. Um, and this really stings for working people. Uh, people in America see their communities under invested in and then a hyper investment in the military apparatus. And so it's a really kind of tragic thing. And you know, by way of a sort of a final remark from me, I might say that one thing I know is for sure, this is not gonna be this East Palestine train derailment disaster. It's not gonna become a part of American history the way it ought to. I spend a lot of my time as a researcher looking at American forgetfulness. And I, I've reached the conclusion that one of the requirements for being an American is to have this kind of amnesia, to be forgetful about you know what has happened even recently. Um, so I opened up the main news page on my phone this morning, and I did not see one mention of East Palestine. Uh, they did mention Chinese spy devices uh, in a very, you know, uh, uh, paranoid headline. They did mention the enormous amounts of weapons shipments the U.S. has provided to the Ukraine. And they also mentioned uh, the kind of fashionable half zip sweater that more and more men are wearing these days. That was headline news. Um, and there was no mention of East Palestine. Uh, so this kind of forgetfulness, it's a necessary ingredient of the kind of crises we're talking about. It wouldn't be possible if the American public were not so willing to forget the crimes of 2008. We're not so willing to forget the crimes at Standing Rock. We're not so willing to forget what happened in Flint, Michigan or Jackson, Mississippi. And I am sorry to say, I worry that we are going to forget what happened in East Palestine. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is, it is sad and it's almost making people angry to hear those people from the companies and government to tell the people, oh, it's going to be okay. It's the water is going to be clean. I mean, the water is flammable. You can burn the water. How can you, how can you tell the people that the, the water is okay? The air is okay. I mean, well, sometimes, sometimes we have to admit that we as the human being, we are not powerful enough. Our technology is not advanced enough to clean those masks. So maybe the best way we can avoid them is to uh, avoid them from the first place. Don't spit them. Don't make any leak. Uh, put more investment on upgrading and maintaining a good infrastructure. Like, you don't have to pay a lot. I mean, uh, it's, it's definitely going to be less than the money you spend on military. You can create a lot of the jobs by invest in, uh, in, in, in infrastructure. Oh, by the way, I have a question. Uh, have you ever taken trains in America? Because I, I know that since you're in Philadelphia, uh, I know that the line between uh, Washington DC to Boston is one of few that profitable in the United States. So what is your feeling from taking trains if you have taken one before? Thanks for the question. You know, the American public typically doesn't take trains. Um, now, I live in Philadelphia, as you mentioned. I used to live in New York City. And New York City is one of the few cities in the United States where you can easily kind of get by without a personal automobile, without your own car. But that's not unusual in the U.S. Um, and even in New York City, you've seen uh, train stations that are, you know, the trash collects there, um, where they get flooded when it rains. Um, they're not as... Um, high quality as what you might see around the world. Um, and here in Philadelphia, we do have a you know local train system that I take frequently. It is affordable, it is convenient, but I will tell you that there has not been a single time that I have boarded the trains that I haven't seen needles discarded on the train uh, from heroin use that literally happens in front of you on the train. You will see people consuming drugs. Philadelphia is a city in which um, you know the political class has really neglected um, a massive crisis of drug use and abuse. Um, and it shows up on our public trans transportation system. So a lot of people uh, typically don't feel safe taking these trains or are worried that they will encounter, you know, having to step over somebody who has passed out. The number of times I've had to check if somebody on the train platform is alive or not is a, it is a common event in Philadelphia for those of us who take the train. So we do have the infrastructure somewhat built to take these trains, but once again, we see that they reflect a uh, growing kind of neglect for the needs of people in Philadelphia. Well, uh, yeah, I have actually I have read uh, some history about the the interstate highway system uh, when President Eisenhower started to build the interstate highway system. 
I mean, the car companies, they kind of hijacked the whole planning, making highways go through uh, cities, cutting like minority areas into pieces and not having entrance in minority areas. I'm always curious how come uh, the big companies and, and, and those capitalists, they can always like hijack things in the United States. It's almost unbelievable. It really is, you know, and we in the U.S. have been sold this idea that having your own vehicle to drive from point A to point B is some kind of freedom. You're free to go where and when you want. Um, and we're not taught about what you're describing, which is how making private, you know, individually owned private vehicles that are terrible for the environment has really decimated our cities and our towns across the country and how there's been a kind of assault from the top to make sure that we rely on these vehicles. Um, so increasingly, you know, I mean, people who are who care about urban planning, people who care about the environment push really hard for more affordable, high quality public transit. But it is such an uphill battle in the U.S. because of the forces that we are up against a range of private interests in this country. They are really actively engaged in lobbying American politicians to make sure that this does not become a priority. Yeah, I mean, uh, true. I went to high school in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, don't take me wrong. I have, I have great friends. I have great classmates, great teachers, uh, all like great people. But, wow, well, the traffic, the traffic in Los Angeles, that was, that was not a good memory. Yeah, it's a notorious stereotype about people from L.A. that they spend hours a day behind their car just inching along, you know. Um, and Los yeah. Angeles is such a beautiful city. If it were connected, uh, people could get around without, you know, needing to sit on these crowded highways. Uh, that would be really something. Well, thank you so much for having me on today. I learned a lot from you, and it was great to be in conversation with you today. And I really hope we can meet again and have another conversation sure. in the future. It's great. It's great talking to you.